Start out with a stock market dump in the fall of 2008. You turn in a book called Bloods a Rover and you rescue the printed word <laughs> between hard covers. You pull people away en masse and get them to apostatize and revoke their allegiance to the internet invaders. <laughs> And I thought about it for a long time. Dog just stood there and I said, get your paws off my crib, you furry cocksucker. I got a lot of living to do first. And I did. Now, parenthood was not really Armand Elroy and Jean Hilliker's bag. He liked cheap women, she liked bourbon and cheap men. They split the sheets in 55. I was seven years old then, but I had been reading copiously since I was three. And I had a big story selling sense building inside of me. And I started seeing things that no four, five, six, seven year old kid should see. I evinced no precocity. I couldn't ride a two-wheel bike. I couldn't do arithmetic. I had to wear loafers because I couldn't tie my shoes. And then, on June 22nd, 1958, when I was 10 years old, my mother was murdered. And here's what happened. All of a sudden, I knew that duplicity and mendacity were in place, and that the version that I was given of the United States of America, of Los Angeles County, of the state of California, of crime, of the psychosexual world as depicted in television, literary, and motion picture <coughs> melodrama may not be the entire truth. Crimes were always solved tidily at the ends of books, television shows, and motion pictures, and my mother's crime has remained unsolved for 51 years. It was the only precocity I ever evinced, but I knew shit. I transmogrified Geneva Hilliker to a dead girl named Elizabeth Short from Medford, Massachusetts, who became known as the Black Dahlia. I used my mother's demise and my ambiguous bereavement as the means to attack Betty Short as a woman, a victim of horrible misogynistic violation, as a fount of curiosity with pit bull ardor, and got obsessed with LA social history, psychosexual history, and criminal history. So I did a lot of perverted shit, but none of it was too terribly bad. I broke into houses, I snipped women's undergarments, I drank, I used drugs, I went to jail, went county jail, was no big fucking deal. And I always harbored the sense that I could tell stories, that I could realize, actualize, what I most liked to do, which was read. The story got to me. This was the dominant narrative of my life. But for years, I thought that if I could write books, I'd have a pad on Ross Moore, a great looking girlfriend, a German sports car, and some snazzy threads. It wasn't until I had a specific story to tell that I was able to realize my dream of becoming a novelist. History has always crowded the frame of my consciousness. I had an unimaginably dim social sense as a young man, but I always saw a guy with a briefcase with a silencer pistol in it sitting outside the corridors of power, and I have always sensed
that there was a private infrastructure of big public events. So I wrote some good books, some better books, some yet better books, the L.A. Quartet, The Black Dahlia, The Big Nowhere, L.A. Confidential, and White Jazz. I got the hell out of L.A. L.A. wasn't big enough for me, and I decided to attack America as a whole with the Underworld USA Trilogy. <coughs> Volume 1, American Tabloid, covers 1958 to 1963 America and is largely the story of the rise and fall of John F. Kennedy. It's Time Magazine's Book of the Year for 1995. Would Time Magazine shit you? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> the follow-up, The Cold 6000. It's my big book of the American 60s, 63 to 68. New York Times Notable Book for 19, 2001, rather. It was an L.A. Times Best Book for the same year. Would those august publications shit you? Perhaps they would. <laughs> now, A.E. Hausman wrote, Clay lies still, but blood's a rover. Breath's aware that will not keep. Up lad, when the journey's over, there'll be time enough for sleep. Hence the title of this novel, the book the Dvorzoi decreed on March 4th, 1948. It's the concluding volume of this trilogy. It marks the chronological conclusion of my life's work because I have a memoir coming out next year and I will follow it up afterwards with a series of books set much earlier in the 20th century. Clay Lies Still, Blood's a Rover, Brett's aware that will not keep what's it about. It is about the moral exhaustion of bad men seeking salvation and redemption and finding it, however tenuously, in the arms of strong women. Tonight I will read three short excerpts from this book, after which I would welcome the most invasively over personal questions that each and every one of you peepers, prowlers, better ass, pedants, panty sniffers, punks, and pimps has for me. <laughs> you had options tonight. You could have stayed home. You could have attended to your sex lives and your drug habits, but you didn't. <laughs> you came here to see me, and I am nothing but grateful. Bloods are over. <coughs> America! <laughs> I window peeped four years of our history. It was one long mobile stakeout and kick the door in shakedown. I had a license to steal and a ticket to ride. I followed people. I bugged and tapped and cut big events in ellipses. I remained unknown. My surveillance links the then to the now in a never-before-revealed manner. I was there. My reportage is buttressed by credible hearsay and insider tattle. Massive paper trails provide verification. This book derives from stolen public files and usurped private journals. It is the sum of personal adventure and 40 years of scholarship. I am a literary executor and an agent provocateur. I did what I did and saw what I saw and learned my way through to the rest of the story. Scripture pure veracity and scandal rag content. That conjunction gives it its sizzle. You recall the time this narrative captures and sense conspiracy. I am here to tell you that it is all 